Good morning. Uh, this is Clint Weeder with McMillan. I got Jason Love on the line here with uh, Midwest Bank uh, coming at you here Monday morning on January 11th. Uh, as you are well aware of, on December 27th, the Consolidated Appropriations Act was signed into law. And with that, a big piece of it was a second round of PPP funding. So today we're going to be primarily focused on that. Um, piece of it. Um, there's a lot of other pieces to it tax-wise, so look forward to uh, additional emails from us on some future webinars that we'll be doing to hit on those pieces. But like I said today, we'll be primarily focused on this new round of PPP uh, that's come out. And we got some uh, guidance from the SBA uh, last week and then late Friday night, I believe it was, we got the applications forms, and then also some updates on timing. So I'll kick it off here to Jason right away, just to kind of give everybody an update on what that timing looks like. So this morning, the PPP application process opened up uh, across the country, but it's only open to CFIs, um, which there's, I don't believe there's any CFI banks in the state of Nebraska. Uh, CFI is a minority-owned bank. Um, they serve an underprivileged area. So as of now, we no banks in the state of Nebraska are open. We're anticipating that we'll probably go live Thursday or Friday or maybe in the first part of the next week. Um, they're going to let them submit applications first, and then they'll, they'll let the rest of the, the banks go in and submit their applications. So so it's uh, probably, another, probably another three or four days before we go live. All right, well, we got a few slides to get through here. If you guys have any questions throughout this, please use the chat box. Uh, we're gonna be watching that throughout um, and answering your questions here throughout, or we can hit on them at the, at the very end. So please uh, don't hesitate to ask any questions here. Uh, we're getting up to speed on a lot of it, uh, just as you guys are. So there's a few things we don't know 100% certainty on yet, but uh, we'll go through what we know as of today. So one of the biggest things that came out of this uh, act um, was the PPP deductibility. Uh, we all know what the CARES Act that was passed last year, the original intent of Congress was to make this tax free. Uh, later on, the IRS came out saying that, yeah, the loan forgiveness is tax free, but the um, expenses used for that forgiveness are no longer deductible. In, in most cases, your payroll that you use for the PPP loan forgiveness. Uh, with this new act that has been um, fixed, so as you can see right now, gross income does not include any amount that would otherwise arise from that PPP loan forgiveness, and all those deductions are now allowable. So that's great. Um, in addition to that, um, the PPP forgiveness will still increase your tax basis, and then it also uh, will not reduce any of your tax attributes, so no negative impacts there. And then, like I said, this is a retroactive change, so it goes all the way back to the beginning of the CARES Act, um, and then we'll also apply it to the second draw of PPP funding. So good news there. All right, so here are some of the PPP provisions in the CCA Act. Um, the, this applies to first and second draw PPP. Um, in case you're a first time borrower this time around, there's additional funds for you. And then also, if you're a second time borrower and can meet certain criteria, you can get a second um, funding in the PPP. Both of those will expire at the end of March, 2021. So we got a little less than three months here to get this done. So the second draw loans are for the hardest hit borrowers, generally under 300 or fewer employees. Uh, you have to show at least a 25% or more reduction in gross receipts in any one quarter in 2020 as compared to um, the similar quarter in 2019. Um, idle and PPP are not included in gross receipts in those calculations, so you wanna exclude those. Um, they are going to be based on calendar quarter. I haven't heard anything otherwise from the SBA or the Treasury on that. Um, you will have to certify that you either have used or will use the full amount of your first PPP loan funds. And then comparisons will differ for borrowers that were in operation the entirety of 2019. We'll go through what that kind of looks like here in a few more slides. So just a little bit here. Clint, I want to mention that on that uh, the 286 million or billion that's been uh, allocated for this program, that's about half of what was uh, allocated the first for the first wave. Um, so I think there's 
some people have some urgency behind that, but we don't feel like there's going to be that many people eligible for this because of the reduction of 25%. So obviously it is urgent to get your application in, but it's not uh, last time around. I mean, it was a mad rush and the money was used up in 12 days. We don't foresee that happening this time around. Okay. Um, according to the SBA, here's a listing of everything that you include in your gross receipts when you're looking at the comparison from quarter to quarter. Um, so it's basically everything that you would think would be included. The one thing it appears it does not include, and, and we've gotten this question from some of our farmer clients, um, you know, Form 4797, the sale of fixed assets, does that get included? Um, based on what I've been reading, um, that will not be included in your gross, re gross receipts when you're looking at the quarter by quarter analysis. So just a heads up there, if anything changes there, we'll let you know. All right, so there's a few alternative approaches um, when looking at the gross receipts. If you were in full operation for the entirety of 2019 and 2020 here, um, there's a simplified approach where you can just look at the full year. So if your full year gross revenue dropped by 25% or more, you can use that as your basis for needing the funds versus looking at each quarter. So it just depends on how you keep your books and records and, and, and where you're at from that standpoint. Uh, you'll need to submit copies of any annual tax forms to substantiate the revenue decline. Um, and Jason will kind of go into a little more detail what they're going to be looking for from their clients uh, to substantiate that, um, including bank statements and financial statements. And then also, like I talked about, there's an alternative approach. So if you were not in business for all of 2019, you can actually look at, um, say, quarters three and quarters four of 2019 when you're comparing, you know, quarter in 2020. Or, for instance, if a borrower started business in quarter four of 2019, um, you can look at quarter two, three, or four of 2020 and compare it to that quarter four of 2019. And But just note that you have to have been in business prior to February 15, 2020 to be eligible for the second draw PPP, just like it was with the first round of PPP. But if you were not in business all of 2019 or started right at the beginning of 2020, there's alternative methods to use to figure out that 25% or more decline in gross, gross receipts. A few more details for second draw borrowers, maximum loan amounts, 2 million. Uh, same as last time, as far as figuring out your applicable loan amount, it's gonna be two and a half times average monthly payroll. We'll go into a little bit more detail on how uh, average monthly payroll will be looked at. Uh, restaurants, hotels, et cetera, in, in the hospitality industry with NAICS codes of 72 can actually use three and a half times average monthly payroll cost. Uh, there's a different calculation if you're a seasonal employer um, where you can actually look at a 12 week period to uh, calculate your average monthly payroll. And then they're also letting you use either 2019s or 2020s um, payroll costs or looking at just a, a rolling prior 12 month period prior to your application date uh, for those payroll costs. So there's a lot of different ways to take a look at these payroll costs to see what's more advantageous to you. Um, but yeah, it's something you're going to want to take a look at. I'm thinking for a lot of borrowers, 2019s might be the best just with the reduced payroll costs you may have experienced in 2020 with the pandemic. Uh, and then as far as the cover period, same as the first time, you can make an election to either use an eight week or 24 week period of time um, to look at uh, for PPP forgiveness. Okay, the second draw document, doc, documentation, um, generally it's gonna be the same as the first draw. So we're gonna require our customers to fill out the application. We'll show you guys the application here in a little bit. Um, you have to prove your payroll expense, so you can use your 941s, your W3s, um, your pseudo reports, as well as last time around, we had a lot of clients that broke down each individual's pay just because they might have had some some employees that were making over 100,000, and you need a discount. If they're making 150,000, you can only use 100,000 towards that calculation. So, out on our website, we'll put a spreadsheet that helps you calculate what you're actually eligible for. Um, like Clint said, um, you can use your 2019 numbers, and if you use the 2019 numbers in the same bank, you don't have to provide all that documentation again. 
Um, for loans over 150,000, you need to submit a revenue decline, which that's going to be uh, tax forms and relevant tax forms, including annual tax forms. Um, if tax forms aren't available, which in most cases are not going to be, uh, quarterly financial statements. And then if your business does not do financial statements, you can use bank statements um, to prove that, that reduction of 25%. And that's for loans under or over 150000 For loans under 150000 all you need to do is submit the application. Um, but at our at the at Midwest Bank, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna ask the customers to show us the 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 twenty five percent revenue re reduction before we submit it to the SBA. We just don't want to get into the issue um, here in twenty four weeks when you're asking for forgiveness and then all of a sudden the SBA asks for it at that time and then for some reason you missed it by five percent or something like that. So we want to determine eligibility at the time of the application. So you don't have a hundred thousand dollar loan or fifty thousand dollar loan sitting out there that they don't forgive. You can go to the next slide. The borrowers to submit the SBA form twenty four eighty three SD. This is for the second draw. Um, Clint, do you want to pull up that application? Yep. Here's what it looks very similar to the first time. Um, they've added a couple things. Um, year when the year when the business was established, the NAICS code. If you don't know that, you can actually just Google it. Whatever industry you're in, if you just Google NI NAICS code, um, you Google that and you'll find it based on your business type. Um, otherwise, when you're checking these boxes, purpose of the loan, you should check all those. Um, for the most part, you should. I mean, it makes sense for everybody. Because when we go into submit for forgiveness, it's going to ask what the money was used for. And from our standpoint, if someone just puts payroll costs and then all of a sudden they're right using utilities for the reduction, it makes sense for them just to check all those boxes. It does ask for your SBA loan number for the first draw. You might have that. Otherwise, your bank would have that, that number and they can help you fill that in. Um, here's where it's going to ask you to prove your reduction on paper. And then it's going to ask you for the owner's, owner's information down below. The questions on the next two pages are very similar to the first application you filled out back in April. Um, you are complying that you're open in February. Um, you're not in bankruptcy. You're not vice president or president uh, you know, of the United States. So a lot of the same questions, they added a couple more, but uh, probably not relevant to most of the businesses that we work with around this area. The lender will submit that, the, the applications on a new SBA website. One thing to note is <clears throat> obviously it's not open to banks yet, but also the last time around, the SBA gave the banks an authorization number right when they submitted it to the SBA. So we knew it was approved. We knew the $20,000 was allocated. This time around, they're going to wait. Um, they're going to review the application that was submitted to them. So it could be hours. It could be days. So I think the main thing is going to be patience. You know, I know a lot of times we communicate with our customers, yep, it's been approved, um, but we might not get approval for a couple of days after the SBA does their initial review of it. And I'm assuming they're trying to eliminate some of the fraud that they had in the program, which there wasn't much, but there was some, so they're just doing a little bit more due diligence. Um, this next sentence here, borrower must submit to lender required documentation to support the calculation of increase. This is actually on the first draw. So if you t if you took out a first draw and you applied for five thousand um, bucks, and you can prove that you probably should have actually got ten thousand dollars, the bank can go go back in and resubmit the loan to the SBA. The one kicker that we're kind of seeing on that, if the loan has already been forgiven, there's probably nothing the bank can do. But if the loan is still outstanding, that's when the bank can go back and and resubmit documentation to approve the increase. Um, here it addresses SBA was the issue a new loan number and that will be delayed from the first round um, and the lender will distribute funds once loan number is received as well as a note has been signed by a borrower. I think last time they gave us a 10-day window to get the money out to the borrowers so I would guess that would be similar that they, they only give us 10 days to, 
to get the application or to get the funds out once there's approval from the SBA. Um, certifications, you certify that you will not receive another second draw. Um, you realize that you've had a reduction in excess of 25% in the comparison year. Um, you have used, and we've talked about this already, have used or will use the first draw on only eligible expenses, um, and you're not an ineligible entity. One thing to note, if your company is in review with the SBA, you, you will not be able to submit for a second draw until that, that the loan is approved by the SBA. But that's only for businesses that are under review or they're asking for more clarification. Um, we've had a handful of our clients get reviewed or audited um, we've had no issues, but it seems to be the higher dollar amounts that they're looking at a little bit more. So, okay, so first draw borrowers, so basically we're going back to PPP1. Um, they've allocated $35 billion for first time borrowers. So, if you're unable to get in on that the first time, um, your business has to have 500 less employees. Um, so, sole props, independent contractors, eligible, self-employed individuals are, are uh, eligible this time. Um, nonprofits, including churches, are eligible. It does add a 501c6, um, as well as designation of marketing organizations to this. Uh, chambers, commerce, commerce are eligible. Um, that, that fall under the 50c3, but they have to have, they have, to have 300 or less employees. And as long as 15% of your receipts, 15% of your activities do not are under a million dollars does not go to lobbying, which I don't think we'll probably have too many of those. And then it adds news organizations and housing corp corporates to corporations to this as well. And maybe this is a good time to talk about the farmers. Oh, you're good. Okay, perfect. That's the next slide. So here's a few other things yeah. with the PPP. Um, we've gotten a few questions on this. So there is a specific carve out this time for farmers and ranchers with Schedule F. They can actually use their gross income instead of the net income on their Schedule F when computing the Schedule F or computing their PPP. Uh, that limit a lot of people on the first go around, especially with farmers. Um, so they have this carve out for it. Uh, you can either use your 2019 or 2020 Schedule F when computing this. Um, loans can be recalculated if it would result in a larger loan and applies to PPE loans before on or after the date of enactment. So a couple things here that we're still looking for clarity on. One is if uh, a farmer applied the first time, already got their loan forgiven, it, it appears that they cannot go back and, and get more if that first PPP loan has already been forgiven. Um, and then the second item of clarity we're looking for yet from the SBA is if a farmer didn't apply for that first round of PPP, are they still eligible under this new provision that's really in a provision for second time borrowers, um, whether they can go and get that. Um, obviously, this would be a big deal for the farmers having it based off of gross receipts versus net income because uh, you just need to show 100,000 of gross receipts to get the, the max PPP loan for a sole proprietor, which is $20,833. So we're going to look for some more clarity there, but that's what we know as of now that it's based off gross, but need to define those two two additional items there. Um, this also hey, defines. Clint. Oh, go ahead. Um, can you maybe explain? So, like, if it was a rancher or a cattle farmer, and they sold some cattle for five hundred thousand, the cost of goods was, you know, four hundred. Uh, let's say uh, four hundred fifty thousand. Are you guys looking to, we've had some questions on this, are they adding back the cost of goods because the receipts are actually what they sold it for, or are they not, not adding back that cost of goods, the cost of livestock? I think from my understanding, you would exclude that cost of goods sold, so you look at just the, the gross amount. Now, there are some questions for like a rancher um, that has breeding stock, and I know I mentioned earlier that the Form 4797 is not included in your gross receipts. Uh, if a rancher were to sell those breeding stock, um, most times they go on Form 4797. Um, so there's going to be some clarification we're going to need from the SBA on, on specifically farmers and ranchers, what's included and not included in those gross receipts. Um, but in that example, Jason, I would assume that you would carve out, not include that cost of sales, and then you just look at the gross cattle sold. 
when computing this. Okay. A good question. Uh, this uh, other provision uh, also defines what a seasonal employer is when, and that goes back to when calculating your average monthly payroll. So if you are in operation no more than seven months a year or um, earn no more than a third of its receipts in any six months in the prior calendar year, you'd fall underneath that seasonal employer ruling. Um, and then borrowers who returned all or part of their original loans may reapply for the difference. They have not received forgiveness. And then Jason kind of hit on this last one already. Just uh, any borrowers that were impacted by the change in guidance uh, got a lower uh, loan amount than what they could have received the first go round. They can go back now and, and get that increased amount. On the on your comment that people may reapply, um, you know, we saw it some here at our bank as well as I know other banks had where individuals might have received twenty thousand or hundred thousand, but based on the public outcry, they felt like they needed to turn the money back in. Those individuals can reapply. That's kind of what that means. I know it's a limited basis or a limited number of people that actually be eligible for that, but um, that's what that means. Perfect. Here's a listing of, of all those ineligible for the PPP. We've hit on a few of these um, already. Uh, new right now, just with everything going on, any entity that is permanently closed its doors will not be eligible for the PPP. Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, if you were not in operation on or before February 15th, uh, this would not apply to you. And there's a whole listing of others. It's pretty much on par with the first go around. Um, I know they added in some stuff in here for the president, vice president, uh, members of Congress or their spouses. They own at least 20% of a, a equity in a company. Uh, those companies can't apply. So they've kind of hit on a few of those just with some public outcry there. But overall, um, most of this is just on par with where we were the first go around. All right, Jason, if you want to talk about uh, the PPP loan forgiveness process with these. Sure, it's basically gonna be similar to last time. Um, besides that, we're adding a couple more things. Uh, payroll costs, which includes group life, disability, vision, and dental insurance, mortgage, in mortgage interest, um, rent expense and utility payments. The additions to uh, the round two is PPP. If you had, if your business had to buy PPP to keep your workers safe, you can use that. Supplier cost, um, operation expenditures, so software, cloud computing, and other HR accounting. Um, property damages um, as they're rioting and stuff like that. Back this last summer, if your businesses suffered a loss due to that, you can add that expense. Um, basically, it's all the same besides those those last four four categories. The split still has to be 60-40, so 60% has to go payroll, and the, the remaining 40% can go to the rest. Now, we had a lot of clients, they basically just used payroll expense since they had the, the 24 weeks. That's kind of what they used. We did have some that did show some rent or some utility expenses as well, so. Got it. So just a, a clarification on those payroll costs, they, they added a few things in there, including that group life, disability vision, and, and dental insurance. So going back to what you mentioned earlier, so if, for whatever reason, if a client incorrectly calculated their payroll costs for the first go around, um, we'll, we'll, and they haven't had their loan forgiven yet, would they be able to go back, recalculate what their payroll costs were to get an increased PPP amount for the first go around? That that's our understanding of how the program's presented right now. Obviously, we haven't been able to get in the portal and see what it takes to resubmit a new application, but if they did not include those expenses in the first time around, they're able to go back and reapply. Got it. Um, so if you remember, the first time around, there was a, a simplified loan forgiveness application for borrowers under 50000 They've moved that up to 150,000 $150, this time, which that'll cover probably 85 to 90 percent of the applications out there. Um, it's basically a one-page document. You sign it. You put in your loan amount, your your loan number, number of employees you re retained, um, estimated loan amounts spent on payroll. It's very simple. They haven't created it, as you can see. They have 24 days to create that form, um, so they haven't created that yet. And you do have to retain that documentation for four years for employment, three years for other documentation. So if you use utility expense, 
rent expense, you do need to keep that for the next three to four years. One thing we're advising our clients is just to get us application or get us application as well as the, the records, and we'll hold on to it for them. Um, we'll scan it in, and we'll just make sure that uh, we we retain it just in case there's ever an audit down the road. And yeah. as we are getting audited on the ones that we have right now, they are asking for that information, basically the information showing that the loan should have been forgiven. So. Yeah, this should make a lot of clients happy with this uh, increased uh, simplified application. And then also, I think it's just really important to remind folks, if you had any reduction in employment, uh, either for an employee that left on their own terms, not because you had to lay them off, make sure you have that documented, make sure you keep it for the four years in case the SBA ever comes back. That way you don't get your, uh, your PPP forgiveness haircut by that amount with employee reduction. So I think that's important. You know, one thing to note is last time around, um, we had we had businesses that were applying. They put the wrong employee count, so they might have did an employee count for the whole year of 2019. So they sent out, you know, W-2s for 100 100 people. When really the day that they applied, they only had 60 people or 50 people. So make sure that you have the employee count right up front. Um, so when it comes time to forgiveness, you don't have to explain yourself so much. Other provisions part of this bill is to repeal the idle advance deduction from PPP forgiveness. Um, if you've already applied for forgiveness, you probably noticed that it was probably $3,000 short, $10,000 short. They have now repealed that. And as we're starting to get payments in on these loans, um, it's actually coming as full. They're not, they're not uh, taking the idle advance out. The SBA has communicated with us that they will be getting us the money plus interest um, in the coming days, coming weeks. They haven't told us exactly how they're going to get us the money, but the money is going to come to us, and then we'll allocate it back to the customers if they've paid off that, that idle advance. And then you'll get the interest as well. Um, there is an extension for payments on the 7A, 7A Nedco loans, Express loans. Um, last year, if you had an SBA loan, they paid six months of payments for you. Um, this time, they're going to they're gonna do three months, and it's going to start in February. The amount is capped at seven k per month. Um, so, if your loan payment's twenty thousand, you get, you will be responsible for the additional eleven thousand. Um, underserved areas will receive additional five more months. We haven't heard exactly how that five months works. What do you have to do to prove it? Um, or if it's just certain areas of the United States that would get that additional five months of payments. And tax treatments consistent with the PPP. So those payments, uh, if you have an SBA loan, S7A, they are not, you don't, you don't have to claim it as income. Initially it was, you had to file 1099, but now you don't have to file that as income. And funding for target idle advances, they have talked about, or we've heard that um, they're gonna give idle advances to businesses that need it. As well as if you receive $3,000 the first time around, you can go back and apply for the additional $7,000 and get you that $10,000 threshold. That's initially what was in the bill. As of last night, you're you're unable to apply for the idle advances. So we're assuming that they're trying to work out some of those kinks for the idle advances to make sure that the money goes to it's who it's supposed to go to. So along with the idle advances, the idle loan program is still available for those struggling businesses as well. Got it. Yeah, I think those are some key things there. So overall, three deals now are tax-free. Your PPP, the idle advances that you originally got, and then if you had any help with the SBA loans that you had prior to um, this pandemic and the SBA paid on those loans for you, those payments are tax-free to you as well. So those three are some nice deals that came out of this. Is this me? Oh yeah, this is you. I think we last. kind of talked about. So we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, for forgiveness, you're gonna need you're gonna need your payroll costs plus your group life, disability, vision, dental. Um, if you recall, they asked for the last four tax last four digits of the tax ID number of each employee. Um, so last time around, there was a spreadsheet that most of our clients use to kind of document documentate that. Um, their 941s, their unemployment forms, that kind of helped 
show what their actual payroll cost was, uh, mortgage interest expense, that'd be a statement from your bank showing how much interest you paid during that covered period. Again, the forgiveness can be eight weeks or it can be 24 weeks, that's totally up to you. Um, the split must to be between 60-40, and we've already talked about the, for, the simplified application, forgiveness application for loans under 150000 Perfect. All right, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, uh, with this act, there was a lot of different tax pieces added in there, including a lot of uh, tax extenders, including energy credits and different things like that. We're not going to get into that here today. Um, here's some key ones that uh, that came out of it, though. They extended the credits for paid sick leave and family leave. Uh, we're actually going to be hosting a webinar here in the next week or two that's going to really hone in on some of these employee employer issues that we're having. Um, so it's going to be more focused on like an HR perspective, what employers are currently going through, issues they're seeing, how they're handling it, and how these tax credits and, and different things like that are playing into helping uh, businesses. Uh, some more to come there. Um, mills are now 100% deductible in 2021 and 2022 if purchased from a restaurant. So those are business mills. Normally, uh, those are only 50% deductible. So now for 21 and 22, those are going to be 100% just to incentivize folks to help the restaurant industry, which has been hit pretty hard here this year, this last year. Uh, one, one piece that's kind of uh, fallen a little bit um, past us this past year was the employee retention credit. The reason for that is it, under the CARES Act, you could not have both a PPP loan and utilize this employee retention credit. Uh, with this new act that has been repealed retroactively to the beginning of the CARES Act. So basically under the CARES Act, if you saw a reduction in gross receipts of 50% or more in any quarter, or if the government required you to either fully or partially close down, for any given period of time, there is a tax credit that would go on your Form 941 um, that would basically reimburse you up to 50% up to 10,000 of wages per employee for the year. So it'd be about a $5,000 credit max per employee. So I encourage you, if, if, if any of those circumstances hit you, um, take a look at that and we can help you with that. But that's a key thing that we can retroactively go back to 2020 and look at. For 2021, for these first six months, it's actually, I think, only a 20 or 25% reduction in revenue and a few other criteria that you have to hit in order to get that. Uh, another key thing is you just can't double dip with uh, your PPP deductible items. So if you used 100,000 of payroll for your PPP forgiveness in 2020, you can't also use that 100,000 of payroll for this employee retention credit. So you gotta kind of split the two. But uh, so that, that could be potentially a big, big item for some restaurants or some other industries that were hit pretty hard here in 2020. So take a look at that. Uh, we talked about the PPP basis issues as far as increasing basis. We're good there. And then IRS has been kind of rolling out with some new programs to help with payment penalty relief, uh, especially if there's a taxpayer that's been really struggling making any tax payments here in 2020, uh, particularly with payroll and different things like that. Um, they're rolling out with some programs to help uh, certain taxpayers with relief. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, um, we are posting stuff to our website uh, to keep everything as up to date as we can. So if you go to our main website and scroll to the bottom here to this coronavirus link, you can click on that. And right now we, we included a tab here just for this new Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Um, under the resources here, we have the applications out there. And then we also have this calculation spreadsheet that we, we have out there. We have a few tweaks to make to it yet, but it uh, will basically help you if you're trying to figure out if you're gonna meet that 25% reduction uh, or not. So basically, you just need to fill in these input fields here in orange. And we kind of made it a little bit more simplified to where you put in your year-to-date gross revenue uh, for each of the periods. So you put your year-to-date information here for 2020, over here for 2019. Then these cells over here will automatically calculate your, your uh, change in gross receipts quarter to quarter. So we'll continue to keep this spreadsheet updated on our website. It's the most current information available to us, but 
want to let you guys know that that's available. And I think like last time, making sure we're flexible because the program changed numerous times last time around. So um, constantly be checking with your bank, your accountants for you know any changes that might be coming about the program. But banks in this area in Nebraska, most banks should be live probably end of this week or first part of next week. So awesome. Uh, just checking our chat section here. I don't see any questions. If you guys think of anything afterwards, feel free to shoot us an email or give us a call. Be more than happy to help you. Um, once again, thank you, Jason, for joining us. And uh, you've been you've been awesome as always. So appreciate your time and and everything. And sounds like we're going to have a beautiful week ahead of us. A couple of days in the 50s for January in Nebraska. We'll take it. Don't think we'll complain about that. So if you don't have anything else, Jason, I think, uh, I think we'll call it a morning. This, uh, this no, will be my... Did you see the questions in the I think, questions uh... tab? I got my chat box open. I don't see any. If you have some, Jess, if you could read them out, that'd be fine. Yeah, there's like a separate questions tab. There's a chat and a questions. Um, so does forgiveness equate to use of funds of previous PPP loan? So I'm wondering if, I guess I don't understand what they're asking there, but um, you know, forgiveness is basically you used all the money and then you applied for forgiveness through your bank and the SBA and it's been approved by the SBA. So if that's, if that's what they're asking on the first one, that's what that means. You know, if you've used all the funds, but you have not applied for forgiveness, you you still haven't officially applied for forgiveness with SBA, if that's what they're going after. Um, the next one is the NAICS, the only qualifier for hotel and restaurant at 3.5 times payroll. We are a family entertainment center with a bar and restaurant license. About 50% of our revenue is food and beverage, but our code is a 7100. Then I don't think they'd be, they've pointed out that the code of 7200 is the one that'd be eligible for three and a half times. Yeah, but I would encourage you to take a hard look to make sure that 7100 is the right code for you. And if you need to change that code I and make sure you have it right for 2020's tax filings, that may be helpful. Um, and yeah, just make sure you talk with your tax uh, person and make sure that they you know can talk with the bank and make sure everybody's on the same page with how that should be but I think you know if you think you can fall underneath that 72 NAICS code I think you can get that to work um, the next one are new 7a loans closed in March example eligible for the three-month payment opportunity um, we're uh... The last time around, if a loan was closed in, let's say June or something like that, they did give them six monthly payments. So we're fully assuming that they will do the same for this this time around, the three monthly payments, as well as SBA will have reduced loan fees on 7As um, going forward until I think like September 21st of 2021. So that's another kicker on the, the 7A. So that can save some people a lot of money. Um, with upfront fees. Okay. Um, I have a business that services the restaurant industry and I'm curious about whether we would be eligible for the 3.5 times of payroll. Do you want to comment on that, Clint? I mean, if it's a supplier and if your your NAISC code is, or SC code is, you know, not 72, you know, maybe that's something you need to review and see if it's if it's correct. Yeah, no, I agree with you there, Jason. Uh, we did have a comment. So uh, the clarification on that Schedule F gross receipts is line nine of your Schedule F. So I guess that would be after your cost of sales for cattle as it currently stands. So I I misspoke earlier. Um, so if you have cattle sales, you got to take the you know your cost of sales off of that to get your gross receipts because right now as it stands, it's coming off of line nine of your schedule F, so just FYI there.
um, can you use the same 2019 payroll info to calculate PPP amount? Yes. Yep. Do you have to apply for round two at the same banks as round one? Um, you don't have to, but if you're using the 2019 information, they're they're encouraging you to go to the same bank. I think if we only took out 5,000 in the idle, can we take out an additional 5,000? That's how the bill is wrote, that you could go back and get to up to that $10,000 grant, but it's not available at this time, and I think there's probably going to be some more that comes from that in the coming days or weeks. Yeah, and it kind of sounds like there's going to be a little bit more targeted there too with the the idle advances from here on out. So we'll we'll have to wait and see what that looks like. Okay. Can I only use payroll for the past, or what if I wanted to add employees? You could use that payroll if you're if you add employees and you apply for twenty thousand bucks. As long as it's payroll costs, you'd be able to use it. If my PPP loan was forgiven, but my idol was deducted, did I understand that I might get that back? Correct. You'll be getting that back plus the interest that you paid on it. Okay. What if your Q3 and 4 are up? If your quarter 2, 3, and 4 are up compared to the 2, 3, and 4 from last year, you wouldn't be eligible. But if your Q2 compared to Q2 quarter. of last year is down, you would still apply. I mean, still it would still work for you. So just because if you had a bad Q2 compared to Q2 of 2019 and then things went up, you're still fine as long as it's just that one quarter compared to the comparable quarter of 2019. Yeah. My company had less than 500 employees in 2019 and less than 300 employees in 2020. Would our company qualify for the second round PPP loan? As long as you can show the reduction in of 25% rev in uh, revenue, then yes, you would be eligible. Can you qualify if you have outside income from your Schedule F? I haven't seen anything in there that would disqualify you from that. Have you, Jason? I haven't. Uh, we had one question earlier today, and we're going to have to get some more clarity. What if you have a Schedule F and you have a Schedule C? Um, and maybe that's what they're kind of alluding to this question. You know, when we input it onto the portal, SBA portal asks the tax ID number. So if we input the same tax ID number twice, it's going to ask, or at least the last time it asked us, or it said that you already have a um, a PPP loan outstanding. So that's where I think we need to get clarity because there are businesses that have multiple schedules. So she said W I should say. W two and Schedule F. Oh, okay. Yeah, she should be. They they should be fine then. Um, there's going to be a lot of farmers that also have. W-2s either with the spouse working or both of them working, part-time jobs, full-time jobs, farming on the side. So I don't think that would be an issue. Okay. Does the 12000 Nebraska grant count as gross receipts? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I have not seen anything specifically regarding that. The SBA did not hit on state programs. I would assume that you would carve those out of gross receipts, no different than the SBA has said the IDLE and the PPP funds um, are not including gross receipts. So I would assume the same for the Nebraska grant. Okay, and the last question is, sorry, um, what period can you use in qualifying the 25% reduction to monthly, quarterly, or annual? It's It's a quarterly look, so any, any one quarter in 2020 as compared to the comparable same quarter in 2019 is what you would look at. And I, I, from my understanding, the SBA has basically kept it to calendar quarters 
correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but it looks like it's calendar quarters. Yep. And then yep. there's those special rules that we talked about with regards to businesses that either started in 2019 or in the very beginning of 2019. There's a few different alternative methods. Okay, and one more question just came, or a couple more just came in. Uh, if you are self-employed but no employees, would you be able to get the new PPP? You'd have to be you'd have to be able to show a reduction of revenue of 25%, um, and obviously you might not have tax returns that aren't done for those individuals yet. So they could use bank statements to show the revenue reduction from 2020 to 2019 or 2019 to 2020. And can a person that has never applied for a PPP apply now? Yes. Okay. Um, there's one other person that had a question. Um, not sure if I can unmute him to ask his question. He was wondering. Um, I'd say just maybe reach out to your banker or accountant. I don't think I can unmute you at this time. And otherwise, that's all the questions. Yeah, I had one more comment on that, whether that Nebraska grant is included or not included in gross receipts. I, there may, it may be just because it's taxable, unlike the PPP and the IDLE, which are non-taxable. But I think I still go back to the fact that I think they're looking at gross receipts that are business operations related versus one-off type of deals like grants or different things like that that helps businesses keep going. So we may or may not get more clarity there, but I would still assume that that Nebraska grant would not be including gross receipts because it has nothing to do with the business operations and how the business was doing during the, the pandemic. Okay. Um, can revenue you... reports as accrual or cash? Say that again. Run revenue reports as accrual or cash? It's based on whatever method of accounting they have followed in the past. So if they're accrual-based taxpayer, you use accrual-based reports for looking at that gross re revenue reduction. And if you're cash basis taxpayer, you got to use cash basis reports for that. Okay. Um, if self-employed, can we use our QuickBooks financial statements versus bank statements for documentation? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then we receive forgiveness due to regulated close, um, not using all our funds on payroll. Can we still apply for a second PPP? That's a good question. I'm not sure. We'd have to get back to that individual. I, don't, sure I, I guess I don't know that answer. Clint does, but... Not off the top of my head. Yeah, I'd need to look into that one too. All right. That is all for now. We will keep our website up to date with the applications as well as this webinar. We'll put this webinar on our website um, as well as some spreadsheets to help you compute uh, your payroll information and forgiveness. Perfect. And we'll, we'll be doing the same. So once again, thanks everybody for joining us. I hope this is informative and helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to us. Uh, otherwise, have a great uh, rest of your week. Take care. Thank you.